those families that today shine according to their brilliant lineages had low and obscure beginnings. Juan de Mariana, La Dignidad Real y la Educación del Rey. Hello and welcome back again. Denise counterattacks by bringing up yet another distinction, one that undercuts Don Quixote's vision of himself. She states that, technically speaking, Don Quixote cannot be a caballero because although hidalgos can be knights, poor hidalgos never are. In other words, Don Quixote is too poor to be a knight. A true knight had to have enough income to support his military and political lifestyle at court, whereas Don Quixote's inferior title only indicates that he is descended from hidalgos. Cervantes has prepared us well for this speech that follows. Precisely in this moment of sociological and psychological crisis, we get Don Quixote's passionate theory of lineage. Don Quixote says that there are four kinds of lineages. Some had humble beginnings and extended and expanded until they reached a great peak. Others, which had great beginnings, conserve and maintain them. Others, which even though they had great beginnings, ended in a point, like a pyramid, having diminished and annihilated their beginnings until they came to nothing. And finally, the rest, which had neither a good beginning nor a reasonable middle and thus will have no name in the end. Did you know, towards the end of the 16th century, the Spanish word caballero had a wide range of meanings. In a literal medieval sense, it meant a soldier mounted on horseback. But in a more figurative sense, it meant a polite, well-educated gentleman, thus anticipating its more common modern usage. This dynamic range of possibilities is radical enough, but even more astonishing are the examples that Don Quixote gives for each case. None other than the dreaded Ottoman Turks embody those who have transformed themselves from humble to great. The static nobility is represented by princes who manage to remain at peace with their neighbors, remaining peacefully within the limits of their states. The example Don Quixote gives of dead-end lineages is striking. He indicates the pharaohs and Ptolemies of Egypt, the Caesars of Rome, and then adds a phrase that mocks authorities everywhere. That entire horde, if that name may be given to them, of infinite princes, monarchs, and lords. The rest are simply the masses. In the end, the pharaohs and the Caesars of the world would seem to amount to little more than the masses. Maybe they're even worse. Whereas Teresa sounded feminist in her debate with Sancho, Don Quixote now sounds misogynistic in his final reply to the women of his household. He's angered by their skepticism, but notice also that his final point discards the idea that virtue is something that can be inherited. From all that I have said, I want you to infer, my stupid girls, that there is great confusion regarding lineages and that the only ones that are truly distinguished and illustrious are those that display these qualities by way of their virtue. Make no mistake, this is a meditation on the nature and origins of virtue. The term occurs eight times and Don Quixote clearly adopts the more liberal humanist point of view. A poor knight has no other means of showing that he is a knight except by way of his virtue and those poor knights that manage to do so will be seen as of good breeding, and not to be seen as such would be a miracle. According to Don Quixote, the Ottoman Turks exemplify which type of lineage? A, those who have great beginnings and have maintained their status. B, those who transcend their humble beginnings to become great. C, those who lack great beginnings and remain anonymous. Correct answer, B, those who transcend their humble beginnings to become great. Finally, recalling another topic we saw in part one, our Hidalgo points out that there are two routes to glory, letters and arms. Recall that Cervantes himself gained his fame via both the sword and the pen. Don Quixote underscores this combination when he quotes directly 
from that great Castilian poet of ours, that is, Garcilaso de la Vega, the great anti-imperialist Petrarchan poet from the era of Charles V. Note, however, that Don Quixote recognizes that achieving greatness brings with it the responsibility of choosing wisely and acting morally. I know that the road of virtue is quite narrow, and the road of wickedness wide and spacious. Very much like Sancho then, Don Quixote has essentially endorsed the possibility of attaining social stature regardless of heredity. Thus, when Sancho arrives at the end of chapter six, Don Quixote's gesture makes sense. His Lord Don Quixote came to greet him with open arms. And note the huge irony connecting parts one and two of the novel involved in the niece's sarcastic response that on top of everything else, Don Quixote is a poet. Oh, woe is me, for my uncle also is a poet. He knows all, he sees all. I'd wager that if he wanted to be a bricklayer, he'd know how to fashion a house as well as he does a cage. This cage must remind us of the one used to transport Don Quixote home at the end of part one. That's all for now. We'll see each other in our next video. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.